Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. My name is Tony Shields, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about how the world's deadliest mushroom just got a little bit less deadly. We're also going to be talking about how mushrooms are officially cool, as proven by science. We're also going to be diving deep into one of the world's most fascinating mushrooms, Agaricus by Sporus. Yes, the boring old button mushroom. A lot of people think that this mushroom isn't all that interesting, but I'm pretty sure after watching this segment you might change your mind and as always if you like mushrooms if you like the mushroom show please go ahead and hit that like button also if you want to see future episodes go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well we are so close to 400,000 subscribers on this channel which is just totally awesome so who knows maybe if you hit that button you'll push it over the edge so thanks again for being here and let's jump into the show mycophobia it's defined as a fear of mushrooms and although a healthy amount of respect is definitely important when thinking about wild poisonous mushrooms, the truth is you are very, very, very unlikely to actually be killed by a mushroom. But eating the wrong mushroom can definitely lead to a very bad time. It's hard to find solid estimates of how many mushroom poisonings exist on an annual basis that actually result in death, but it does happen every single year, even in the United States, it's probably around three per year, and up to about 90% of those fatalities are the result of one single species of mushroom. It's called Amanita phylloides, also known as the death cap, and according to the very unlucky few that have tried it, it's actually pretty tasty. So if you were to be killed by a mushroom, this would likely be the culprit. Now, there are other mushrooms that contain these same toxins, but the thing about Amanita phylloides is, and we've talked about this on the show before, it has figured out a way to reproduce itself without finding another partner, meaning that it can reproduce a lot faster, so it's very prolific, and it is starting to show up everywhere. Not only that, but when this mushroom is young, when it's still in its egg form, it actually does resemble another edible mushroom known as the patty straw mushroom or Vulvariella vulvaceae, which doesn't grow wild in North America, but still people might be out in the woods, they'll see it, they think it's the patty straw, so they'll harvest it and eat it or cook it for their family, and it has a very bad result. But scientists might have finally found an antidote, and people have been looking for this for a very long time because the substances in these mushrooms, the amatoxins, are some of the deadliest substances in the natural world. Up until now though, it has been really difficult to find something that might actually work as an antidote because the way this toxin works in the body has not been that well understood. So here is the article that kind of summarizes the research published in Nature. And it says, deadly mushroom poison might now have an antidote with help from CRISPR. CRISPR being the gene editing technology that not only helped scientists figure out how these toxins kill, but also helped them discover substances that might be able to stop it. So here's what they did, and it's kind of a two-step process. So first, they used this CRISPR gene editing technology to create a pool of human cells, each with a different genetic mutation. They then expose these cells to the deadly toxins from Amanita phylloides and try to see which of these cells were able to survive. If these certain cells were able to survive, then that means they have something that helped them fight off the toxins, which was revealed to actually be a lack of this certain enzyme, a lack of STT3B, which according to the article is a part of a biochemical pathway that adds sugar molecules to proteins. And this kind of makes sense when you think about how the deadly toxin in this mushroom actually works. These amatoxins basically shut down a key enzyme enzyme in our body that allows us to produce certain proteins and then it gets recycled over and over in the liver really compounding the effects. This eventually leads to complete organ failure, not only the liver but all of the bodily organs which is why this mushroom is so deadly. Now once they figured this out, the second step for the researchers was to sift through a large library of about 3200 US Food and Drug Administration approved compounds to see if there are any of those compounds or substances that randomly happen to block the action of this enzyme. And they found one. They actually found a bunch, but most of these compounds kind of failed in further testing, but there was one that succeeded. It is known as indocyanine green, not cyanide green, indocyanine green, which was a compound that was developed in the 1950s by Kodak, of all things, and it's already approved for human use for medical imaging. They then started testing these compounds on mice who have been affected by these amatoxins and found that it actually worked. The mice that 
received this endocyanine green had a way better survival rate than the ones that didn't, which is awesome. But does that mean the solution to Amanita phylloides poison has been discovered? Do we no longer have to worry about eating the death cap? Well, no, and here's why. First off, when they tested it on mice, it didn't work 100% of the time. Mice that were treated with endocyanine green survived about 50% of the time, whereas the mice that weren't treated only survived about 10% of the time. So a huge improvement in survival rate, but not a perfect antidote. But the other really important factor is the amount of time between the ingestion of the mushroom and the administration of the antidote. So in the study, the mice were given the antidote four hours after they were basically poisoned with the amatoxins. And this actually leads to another really fascinating aspect of this mushroom. It doesn't kill people in a linear fashion. And at some point, you know, people who have been poisoned by this mushroom feel like they're getting totally better on their own. Basically how it works is if you ingest this mushroom, maybe a couple hours later, you'll start to feel really sick. You might get some digestion issues, you might get some diarrhea or vomiting and, and you know, pretty relatively mild symptoms. And then you'll start to feel better and you'll think, oh man, like I'm glad that's over. But in the background, this whole time, your liver is kind of recycling these amatoxins and the effects are actually getting worse and worse. And it's starting to affect your other organs. And then 24 or 48 hours later, it's basically over. You could have complete organ failure often will need a liver transplant. So by the time most people will feel sick enough to go to the hospital, like 24 or 48 hours later, of course, if they were unaware that they had actually consumed the death cap, but by the time they get to the hospital, it might be too late to actually administer this antidote. Now, of course, it hasn't been tested on humans yet, but since it's you know already kind of approved for human use, researchers are hoping this is something that might be able to be attempted soon. Obviously, the best situation for everyone even though there maybe kind of could be possibly an antidote is just to never eat any mushroom that you're unaware of what it is or you're not 100% sure of its identity because like I said at the top, although it is very, very rare and very unlikely to actually be killed or to be seriously poisoned by a mushroom, it is possible and we don't quite have an antidote yet. Again, this is just another really fascinating aspect about mushrooms. They are these chemical factories. I mean, plants are too, right? Plants create all sorts of compounds, but mushrooms seem to be in a league of their own. They're creating deadly compounds like amatoxins. They're creating compounds that are actually really good for us, like the ones found in functional mushrooms, and you have superfood mushrooms. And then you also have some mushrooms that are producing compounds that can somehow unfathomably change our consciousness. So it's just fascinating to think about the range of different compounds that mushrooms can produce. If you wanna dig into this a little bit more, I did put the link to this uh, article and this research in the description below if you wanna go ahead and check that out. On to our next story. Now, I've always known that mushrooms are cool. I talk about it all the time. But now this undisputable fact has been proven by science. And I just thought this was kind of a fun story that I wanted to share. And it's this article about some new research that came out that said mushrooms seem to be able to regulate their own temperature. And basically what these researchers did, and I can scroll down here and show you the graphic, is they took this thermal imaging camera and they took images of a bunch of different mushrooms, mushroom fruiting bodies in their natural environment. And you can see pretty clearly here, the pictures are kind of grainy, but you can see all of these different mushrooms and then the thermal image of them, the mushroom fruiting bodies are clearly cooler than the surrounding environment. And this happens to be the case for all of these mushrooms that they were looking at. It says, in contrast to animals and plants, the temperature and thermal regulation of fungi are relatively unknown, write the researchers in the published paper. Our data suggests that not only mushrooms, but yeast and mold communities can maintain colder temperatures than their surroundings. And to be fair, it's not that surprising to see because when you think of what mushroom fruiting bodies are, well, they're made up of mostly water, right? Most mushrooms are like 90% water. So as they lose this water to the surrounding environment, they cool off through the process of evaporative cooling. So why is this important? Well, I don't really think that it is that important. To be fair, it's just kind of a neat fact to share. But the authors of this paper think that it could have some potential implications for our climate because about 2% of the Earth's biomass is actually made from fungi. So fungi accounts for about 2% of the Earth's biomass. So it could have some potential implications for creating cooler environments. They also think that it could have some applications for industrial cooling, which is a little bit more far-fetched, but hey, mushrooms never cease to amaze me, so you never know. Now we 
have talked a bit before about the important role that mushrooms play in our environment, not just the fruiting bodies, but also the mycelial networks. For example, we did an interview with Toby Kears from Spun Network, which is trying to, she's trying to map out the entire mycelial network on the planet. Pretty cool interview. If you want to go check that out, I'll put the link in the description below. But the headline is this. Fungi are super important, and if we didn't have them, our world would be in not so good of a place. So it makes sense to understand how they're doing these things, understand what they're doing for our planet, and obviously to try and protect them. So I'm sure you're all dying to know, yeah, mushrooms are cool, but now that we have the research, what is officially the world's coolest mushroom? And according to this research, it is Chlorotus austriatus also known as the oyster mushroom. And they did test a bunch of different species. You can see here they did some Amanita species, some Rushulas, some Belites. Uh, they even did some like inky cap style mushrooms. But yeah, the clear winner here was Pleurotus austriatus, the oyster mushroom at 5.9 degrees Celsius of a temperature difference between the fruiting body and the surrounding environment. And this makes sense when you think about it because the way that oysters grow, these kind of overlapping folds, they have a lot of surface area, which means they have a lot more evaporative cooling, which means they are officially a super cool mushroom. So you've heard of mushroom coffee, but have you heard of mushroom coffins? Another quick piece of mushroom news that's making the rounds this week. And we have talked about this before, but I think previously it was just kind of a concept. But now this company called Loop Biotech is officially selling mushroom coffins, or I guess more accurately, mycelium coffins. So the basic idea is that these coffins, as compared to traditional burial methods, will biodegrade quickly and close the loop, as they say, while also posing the somewhat morbid question are you waste or are you compost? So now you can buy the Loop Living Cocoon, which is a mycelium based coffin, the Loop Forest Bed, which is like an open coffin or funeral carrier, and the Loop Earthrise, which is like an urn for cremation that can be buried underground and it also comes with a little tree on top, apparently. Loop Biotech is the name of the company and it is kind of pitched as this high tech thing, but in reality, it's a pretty simple use case for the natural properties of mycelium. Some types of mycelium like reishi, for example, lead themselves perfectly to this kind of thing because they're really tenacious and you can make all sorts of materials, not just coffins, but also building materials and wall panels and all sorts of different things because the reishi just kind of glues everything together. And it reminds me of a story I saw a couple years ago about a university student who built a canoe out of reishi mycelium. So basically what they did was you can, you can take sawdust or some sort of substrate and form it into any shape. And then you inoculate that with reishi and the reishi will grow throughout it and kind of glue everything together and then you have this canoe or the exact same process probably that you can use to make this coffin or these urns or basically any sort of shape or building material. Again, the benefit here is that it fully degrades and that is kind of how they're pitching this by closing the loop. So these coffins go underground, they very quickly degrade and that's that. So I think it's just still kind of cool. I mean, we're going to see a lot of these different uh, use cases for mycelium and the natural properties of mycelium, um, but I don't know how popular mycelium coffins will be, but who knows. On to our next story, the surprising secrets of button mushrooms. Yes, boring old button mushrooms are kind of like the vanilla ice cream of the mushroom world, and I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, what could possibly be interesting about button mushrooms? Well, lots, actually. I thought it'd be fun to go over some of the more interesting aspects of the common button mushroom, so next time you see it at the grocery store, you'll have a whole new perspective on this boring mushroom. Starting off with a fun fact about mushrooms that a lot of people don't know. Now, if you go to a restaurant or a grocery store, and oftentimes they'll have a mushroom medley that consists of white button mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, and portobello mushrooms. But what if I told you all three of those mushrooms are the exact same species, Agaricus bisporus. Cremini mushrooms are just a brown variety of the white button mushroom, and portobello mushrooms are just creminis that were allowed to continue to grow and get to full size before being harvested. In fact, all button mushrooms used to be the brown variety, what we now call creminis, 
until in 1926, a Pennsylvanian mushroom farmer found a white button mushroom growing in the bed and it was just a mutant. It was just a genetic mutation that happened randomly that was growing in his bed of mushrooms. And he thought, wow, you know, this is uh, unique. This is interesting. We should try and propagate this. So he took the mushroom, he cloned it, which is cloning mushrooms is, you know, not the same as cloning mammals. So this is not a dolly the sheep situation. Basically you just take a little piece of tissue, put it on a plate, you can grow with mycelium and you create a new strain. So he took this mutant, this random white button mushroom growing in a bed of cremini mushrooms and then started to grow that out. And that is the strain that is so commonly cultivated today. And when I say commonly cultivated, I mean like the most common mushroom in North America and one of the most commonly cultivated mushrooms in the entire world. I think in North America alone, there's hundreds of millions of pounds grown every single year. And on a worldwide basis, it's almost 1 billion pounds of these mushrooms that are cultivated. Of course, mushroom growing technology is always changing as farmers are trying to figure out ways to grow more mushrooms, to to have longer shelf life, to grow mushrooms faster. And this is what led to, in 2015, scientists discovering that you could actually genetically modify a mushroom to prevent it from bruising. So again, using CRISPR gene editing technology, which we talked about earlier in this show, they were able to remove the gene from the white button mushroom that actually caused this bruising. Now, this is pretty interesting because if mushrooms don't bruise, obviously they will have a longer shelf life. They can sit on the shelves of the grocery store longer before people don't wanna buy them anymore because they're all bruised up and, and broken. And if you could prevent that bruising reaction, well, maybe you could sell a lot more mushrooms. Now, this actually got a fair amount of attention when it was first discovered because the white button mushroom became the very first genetically modified organism using CRISPR technology that was able to skirt through the USDA approval process. And the reason is because no genetic material was being added to the mushroom, they were only removing genetic material, which allowed it to get through any sort of regulatory issues. Now, I don't actually know how widespread this is, if anybody's actually growing mushrooms or this specific strain of gene edited mushrooms, but it's still pretty interesting to think how you can remove a gene from a mushroom to change a certain characteristic. It makes you wonder about the future possibilities of this technology. Now, growing button mushrooms hasn't always been this high tech. In fact, when people first started cultivating them, the whole idea of how to do it kind of happened by accident. Now, originally it was called the Paris mushroom and it was grown in France. And basically how they did it was they would find wild specimens in the wild and kind of mix them in with some compost and just kind of hope that they grow. But as the story goes, in the year 1811, a Parisian mushroom farmer who was super disappointed with his lackluster harvest, basically grabbed it all and hucked it into a quarry to throw it away. But to his surprise and to his delight, the mushrooms started growing really well inside of that quarry. And knowing what we know today, this actually makes a lot of sense, right? Button mushrooms like cooler environments, they like damp environments and they don't actually need natural light like the other forest mushrooms do in order to grow properly. So a quarry would be a pretty nice environment for these mushrooms to grow naturally. This discovery kicked off an entire industry of mushroom growing in France where they would grow mushrooms underground, they would grow them in caves, and they would use an intricate series of pulleys and ropes to get the mushrooms up to the surface. But the other big win obviously for this discovery was you no longer had to rely on the outdoor conditions and you could all of a sudden grow mushrooms year round because the temperatures and the conditions in the caves didn't change throughout the seasons. So it really made mushroom farming a lot more viable. Now mushrooms today aren't grown underground for the most part, they are grown above ground in mushroom houses, managing a lot of these same conditions. And the real secret sauce to growing mushrooms today is the compost. That's what makes all of the difference in terms of growing really high quality agaricus bisporus or button mushrooms. And I think it's pretty safe to say that we have now cracked the code on how to grow these things since almost a billion pounds of them are growing every single year. Now I mentioned that button mushrooms do not need sunlight in order to grow properly. It's kind of a unique thing that you can kind of grow them in the dark or grow them underground. But if you do give them sunlight, they develop a new superpower. In in general, plant foods, so think about like anything you see in the produce section of the grocery store, in general, they do not contain vitamin D. But there is one exception to this rule, and that is UV light exposed mushrooms. If you expose button mushrooms to sunlight, they become an amazing source of this essential nutrient.
Now, I'm not gonna dive too deep into this because we did do an entire segment on this topic, so go ahead and watch that if you're interested. But it's not just vitamin D. Mushrooms are actually super rich in all sorts of other nutrients. And I know there's kind of a common sentiment for whatever reason that mushrooms are void of nutrition, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. They're actually more like a superfood. Look at this page from the Mushroom Council, which shows all sorts of nutrients and benefits that you can get from mushrooms, like vitamin B, riboflavin, niacin, pantothenic acid, which helps maintain healthy skin and digestive systems, selenium, which is an antioxidant, copper, which helps make red blood cells, potassium, which is key for your heart and your nervous system, and ergothionine, which is one of the most interesting compounds. You might not have heard of it before, but mushrooms are the highest dietary source of this unusual amino acid, completely dwarfing any other food. And in fact, some scientists think that this ergothionine is so important, mainly acting as an antioxidant, that it should be classified as a vitamin. It's sometimes called the longevity vitamin because it is thought to be so useful for anti-aging. So next time somebody tells you that mushrooms are just empty filler, well, now you know that they're more like a superfood. Finally, and this is kind of unrelated, but it might be interesting for you to know that there are other varieties of this mushroom that grow out in the wild. So there are a few like Agaricus campestris, also known as the meadow mushroom, and Agaricus arvensis, also known as the horse mushroom, and Agaricus augustus, all of which are edible wild versions of button mushrooms in some way. But truth be told, although there are plenty of beginner friendly mushrooms to go hunt in the wild, the agaricus genus, so the genus that encompasses these you know, wild button mushrooms is probably not the most beginner friendly and probably not the best place to start because if you weren't too familiar with them, you could possibly misidentify them. There are a number of poisonous lookalikes so it's probably not the best place to start, but it's still pretty interesting to know that sure, if you're walking through a meadow, you might just see a wild button mushroom growing in the grass. And that's a wrap for this episode. I hope you learned something new about mushrooms. I know I always do, and that's one of my favorite parts about doing this show, because no matter how much I learn, there's always something else to know about the fascinating kingdom of fungi. So thanks again for watching. If you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, go ahead and hit that like button. It really does help the channel grow. And if you want to subscribe to the show, go ahead and do that. Again, we're so close to 400,000 subscribers. And it'd be really cool if this episode pushed us over the edge. Finally, if you want to hang out in between episodes, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. My handle is at FreshCapTony. You can come hang out with me there. I do research for the show. I interact with people. And it's just a really great place to hang out and uh, hang out with the mushroom community. So thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.